Good morning. Good morning. Let's go ahead and begin class with prayer. Gracious Father in heaven, we again are so thankful that you're our Father, and we thank you for your love, your truth, your methods. We ask that your spirit will join us today and enlighten our minds, but transform our hearts. Bring us into unity with you and make us effective to share this message to the world. Be with our friends around the world, be with the families here and those that uh, can't be here today that continue to advance your cause. We pray in your holy name. Amen. Amen. And before we get into the lesson, just a couple quick announcements. Again, reminding people, two weeks from today, we're going to be in Dallas doing the Power of Love training and equipping course. So that means that while we're doing lesson three today, next week we're doing lessons four and five. Because we won't have class here because the entire team will be in Dallas on the weekend of the 18th. So next week we start class at 920 and for those online, we'll start broadcasting at 9.20. And we'll go to 10.20 for lesson four, have a 10 minute break, and from 10.30 to 11.30, we're going to do um, lesson five. And so please come early next week. Uh, the building doesn't allow us in electronic locks. We've got this space rented from nine to 12. So the electronic locks unlock at nine. So we'll get in the building at nine. So for those of you who can volunteer to help us set up, it would be great if you could be here around nine because uh, we got 20 minutes to get the room set before we can uh, start uh, our first class. And we wanna kind of be on time with that. Okay, and then there's still time for those who are the late, last minute type planners. Uh, you can still sign up. I think we have 390 people now registered to attend at this event, and it's going to be a really fun, uh, powerful weekend, and we encourage you to come if, you, uh, if your schedule can accommodate. And then reminding people of the Heavenly Sanctuary and Investigative Judgment rewrite. Uh, we are asking if you have the first edition, which has a different picture on the front, destroy it, throw it away, get rid of it, and use this edition. And we've had some extremely positive, more positive feedback with this edition. And this was uh, basically rewritten based on the feedback we got from you from the first edition. And we want to thank you for that feedback. Now we're doing lesson number three in the uh, quarterly entitled Daniel. And the title is From Mystery to Revelation. From Mystery to Revelation. Uh, and when you hear that title, From Mystery to Revelation, do you think merely of the infinite knowledge of God and, and, and all the mysteries of the cosmos and universe? Or do you think of something more precise? Is God the revealer of mysteries? Is the Bible one of God's primary mechanisms, means, tools to reveal mysteries to us? The question is what mysteries are revealed in the Bible? Are all mysteries revealed in the Bible? Are some mysteries especially or specifically maybe not revealed in the Bible and God leaves those for our discovery, for us to just research and discover whether it's mysteries of how the atom works the mysteries of physics. Would we think the Bible is the, is the revealer of the mysteries of physics? No. Probably not. Probably not. Yes? In, uh, Acts of the Apostles, it's stated in the Pentecost chapter that it's not given to man to understand the nature of the Holy Spirit. The whole paragraph on that. Interesting. So what types of mystery is God actively revealing if he's not revealing all mysteries? This is out of Council's Teachers, page 385. See if, you, see if you agree with this or disagree. So also Christ presented the principles of truth in the gospel. In his teaching, we may drink of the pure streams that flow from the throne of God. Christ could have imparted to men knowledge that would have surpassed any previous disclosures and put in the background every other discovery. He could have unlocked mystery after mystery and could have concentrated around these wonderful revelations, the active, earnest thought of successive generations till the close of time. But he would not spare a moment from teaching the science of salvation. His time, his faculties, and his life were appreciated and used only as a means for working out the salvation of the souls of men. He had come to seek and to save that which was lost, and he would not be turned from his purpose. He allowed nothing to divert him. Does this suggest a specific focus of God's revelation? Do you agree or disagree? Before we specifically focus on this question of the mystery that God is revealing, what is the theme of scripture? 
when we read scripture? What's its theme? You know, there's a, a quote, pardon? Salvation. Salvation. There's a quote in uh, the book Education, the student should learn to view the word as a whole, comparing, comparing the various parts to the grand central theme. The theme, salvation. Would, Christ came to save, even. Would we say that the theme of salvation, though, is a theme, a sub-theme, in, inside a different theme? God's love. Is the truth about God a theme inside a sub-theme? Yes. The whole thing is good versus evil. Oh, okay. The, there's a theme of good versus evil going on. And salvation is a theme in that plan, which is a manifestation of God's love, which is in that plan. But there's a battle between the forces of good and a battle between the forces of evil. We would call this the great controversy theme or a theme of, of, of cosmic war. Does the Bible teach us this theme? Satan is the father of lies. And, 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 and think about the two systems. The God's system, truth, love, liberty or freedom. Satan's system, father of lies, selfishness, coercion. These two big themes are antagonistic. Antagonistic. They're at war. Satan, um, father of lies. And what would lies cause, result in, create in the minds of people who believe them. Okay, it would result in fear. Okay, what else? Confusion. Confusion. Misunderstanding. Distortion. Falsehood. Things not being clearly understood, and if not clearly understood, they're mysterious. Mysteries. Mystical things. God is the God of truth, of light, of openness. God is the revealer of truth, the source of truth, the constant shining light of truth. This is a consistent theme of scripture. Jesus is the light which lightens all men. So God is revealing truth against the antagonist who is trying to obscure and confuse with lies and misrepresentations. This is a, a dynamic going on. Uh, the obstructor of understanding is, is Satan, the founder of superstition, the promoter of mystery and mysticism and spiritualism. And what is spiritualism? Can you define it? It's a form of mysticism that purports to pursue knowledge. Spiritualists purport to pursue knowledge. But they have a specific mechanism that you can, if you look at the method or the mechanism they pursue knowledge by, you can identify it as a fraud. All forms of spiritualism seek knowledge without evidence or the use of reason. They all do. Which ultimately, when you go down that path and trust in those methods, it darkens your understanding. It darkens your mind, makes you superstitious. So spiritualism seeks to know something via the lines on your hands, the selecting of cards, the shape of tea leaves, the falling of bones, the entrails of animals, the declarations of a fortune teller, and many, many, many more. They're seeking knowledge. People go to them, I want to know something. But the method they use is without evidence, and without the use of reason. So none of the methods of spiritualism are based on evidence, facts, truth, reality. They're merely claims. Thus, it is the ground, think this through now, this method is the ground of the deceiver and the liar mm -hmm. who has no truth on his side. That's the ground where you will find the deceiver and the liar. Of course, he leads these things. Yes, Satan. Influence their thinking. Yes, Satan is, of course, the one behind these methods, these superstitious and supernatural and mystical ways. Satan is the creator of lies, the creator of confusion and mysteries in regard to God, in regard to God's design law, in regard to God's character, God's methods, God's purposes, and God's plan of salvation. He all 
attempts to shroud in mysticism, in mystical, in, in secrecy, in confusion, beyond comprehension, something we can't understand, something magical, something supernatural, something that is not connected with anything that you can, can, can process or appreciate. It's just something you have to believe in and have faith on. You're describing most of Christianity. I know. And we're going we're gonna to unpack and, re, and, re, and reveal how most of Christianity is bought into the superstitious distortions. This is why the Bible says darkness covers the people and gross darkness the people. God is the source of truth. God is the revealer. Why do you think the last book of the Bible is called Revelation? Bless her, he got, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. It says right in the opening verses. He's revealing something to us. God is the one who makes known, the one who provides light, evidence, facts, teaches us reality in order to free our minds from lies. God wants us to think, to use reason, to understand, to comprehend. I gotta take a pause, back up, tell you this week I got an email again from one of our supporters who was presented with a document that seems to make the circles, and I get an email from somebody that has read this document uh, that a critic of ours has uh, put online. About every six weeks, somebody uh, emails me, oh, have you, have you seen this? Have you read this? It's been going on for about eight years. <laughs> yes, I've seen it, I've read it, and I've written a rebuttal to it, and so anybody who asks me, I send my rebuttal to, and the reply back is that was the rebuttal just answers everything and clears it up. But, but this document, one of the p main points of the document is that Jennings values reason. <laughs> Shame. <laughs> and we all know that God is an infinite God, and if you reason, well then you've elevated reason above scripture and you no longer trust the Bible. I, I don't know what he does with Isaiah 118. Come, let us reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, they'll be well. Oh, every person should be fully persuaded in their own mind. Romans chapter um, 14, 5. Hebrews 5, the mature, those who have developed by practice the ability to discern the right. I don't know what they do with these texts, but they certainly don't reason through them. <laughs> God wants us to reason. And why does God want us to reason? Understand reality again. The war between the liar who has no truth and the revealer of truth. That's the war. What does the revealer, the one who possesses the truth, want people to do? If you have been lied about and you have all the evidence that shows it's a lie, what do you want people to do? Just believe based on testimony? Or look and reason and weigh the evidence? That's what God wants from us. That's why these positions that tell people not to reason, they're not from God. You can identify these types of pursuits of so-called knowledge. Let's read the Bible. Take it as it reads. Don't think about it. If it says it, you do it. You don't question it. You just have faith. That's not from God. Think of all the abuses that happen because people read the Bible and don't think about what it means. So, God wants us to think to reason. Now, let's examine a little more closely some specific, the specific mystery that Satan's lies have created in regard to God and, God's, and what God is working to reveal. Ephesians 1, 9, and 10. Having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he has purposed in himself, that in the, the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. What's, what mystery is being revealed here? What's this mystery? Did you hear it? That has not been understood. That the universe is being unified into one through Jesus Christ. How's that not been misunderstood? Because God's a, a preference. He prefers people with a certain genetic linkage to other people without that genetic linkage. He prefers people who keep a certain ritual versus those who don't keep a certain ritual. God, is, God has a, 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 a he, you, you understand how the traditions that have come down do not have God as a unifier, but as a divider. The mystery is God is working to bring into unity, into one. 
How about this? We're talking about Daniel. We're in, in Daniel, Daniel chapter 2. Daniel is revealing Nebuchadnezzar's dream, and in Daniel 2, starting verse 27, it says, No wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mystery. Notice, God is a revealer. He is the source of truth. He makes things known. He removes obscuring uh, ideas and makes clarifying truths known. Uh, he has shown, again revealing, shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the days to come. Your dream and the visions that pass through your mind as you lay on your bed are these. As you were lying there, O king, your mind turned to the things to come. And as the revealer of mysteries showed you what is going to happen. As for me, the mystery has been revealed to me. Again, just pointing out the, 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 the text repeatedly emphasizes God as revealer not as obscurer. He doesn't make things mysterious. God makes things known and understood. He reveals mysteries. As for me, the mystery has been revealed to me, not because I have great wis greater wisdom than any other living men, but so that you, O king, may know the interpretation and that you may understand. Wait, understand? We are to understand? What went through your mind? So what was the mystery that was revealed to the king through Daniel? The ultimate mystery. Of course, it's the multi-metal man dream. But the conclusion here, in the time of those kings, the feet, clay and, and, and iron, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. You're looking down the corridor of the time. The end result, here's the conclusion of the matter. There's going to be a unity, a kingdom set up. It's the same mystery all the world coming together under one head. Notice in the New Testament, Romans 11, 25 and 26. I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers, so that you may not be, uh, may, may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles come in, and so all Israel will be saved. What is the mystery? Gentiles and Jews are both being saved. That's a mystery. They didn't understand that. The Jews really thought that Gentiles couldn't be saved. How is that possible? How could you be saving these non-Jews? We know the promises are to Abraham and his descendants. No Christians today think the same thing? Sure they do. Many Christians are still confused about, uh, I encourage you to go to my website, read the blog from last week about who is an Israelite. Okay, I put a blog up last, who's an Israelite? You'll discover, quite fascinating, the Bible teaches who a real, and I'll just go real quick. An Israelite is somebody who's the, the a, a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jacob's name was changed from Jacob to Israel. So an Israelite is a descendant. If you're a descendant of Abraham, you have the faith of Abraham. Those who have the faith that Abraham has because of, becomes a descendant or a child of Abraham. The Bible makes that very clear with the text there. If you're a descendant of Isaac, you then have faith in the promised one. Isaac was the promised child, the metaphor for Christ, and so you accept the promised one as your savior. And if you have the faith of Jacob, uh, excuse me, if you have a child of Jacob or a descendant of Jacob, then you having the faith of Abraham to accept the, uh, the, promised, ch the promised one as your savior, you, like Jacob, wrestle with God. With God, you wrestle with your own fear and selfishness until you achieve the victory and then your name is changed from deceiver Jacob to Israel, one who with God overcomes. And that's what it means to be a child of Abraham. Yes, uh, hand somewhere, yes. Uh, on TV this week, Pastor Jeffers, who's a leader in the, among the evangel evangel evangelicals, evangelicals uh, he was asked about Israel, what he feels and what he thinks, and he said something about the Bible says if you bless Israel, you will be blessed. If you curse Israel, you'll be cursed. And that ended it for him, you know, so you've got to do that. And it's true if you understand who Israel is. The sad reality is people view Israel as genetics. Not Israel as spiritual. Not Israel as the people who have faith like Abraham, who believe in the promised one like Isaac, and who have had the victory over selfishness like Jacob and become reborn in heart or their hearts circumcised by the Spirit. So if we bless those who are like Abraham in character, thus they are descended like that, then we are blessed. But they don't view it that way. They see it as, as genetic, biological. Yes? Uh, I agree. The same thing. Galatians 3, if you're Christ. You're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. 
as well as Romans 2 that says he is a Jew which is one inwardly, yep. not which is one outward. Yep, that's exactly right. So back, back to the, um, the mystery, Romans 16, 25 and 27, to 27. Now to him is able to establish you by my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the commands of the eternal God so that all nations might believe and obey him. What's this mystery? Again, notice it's a universal plan to save all peoples. And in the first one, it was also bringing heaven into that unity under Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 52. Listen, I'll tell you a mystery. We'll not all sleep, but we'll be changed in a flash and twinkling of an eye. The last trump. Notice there's adding a layer. What's this mystery? It's the mystery of restoration into unity with Christ, where we actually have a little more detail of the physical restoration. In Ephesians 3, 2 through 6. Surely you've heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation as I have already briefly written. In reading this then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to men in other generations as it has been now revealed by the Spirit of God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together of the promise of Jesus Christ. Notice the same mystery over and over again. It's, this is a mystery. And then we talk about in Ephesians 5, the husbands love your wife as Christ loves the church, sacrificing himself for him, coming into unity of one. And, and, and for, for this reason, man will leave his father and mother and be united with his wife. The two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery. But I'm talking about Christ and the church. Wait a second. Hey, I, what, what, what? We, I, I took a sh sharp left turn there, didn't it? My, well, the, the profound mystery. Somehow there's a mystery here that we don't understand because we've been believing lies about how we can come into unity and be one. So you remember Jesus' prayer in John 17. Father, I pray that they will be one. Me and you and you and me and all of us together united. There's a unity, there's a mystery of unity. Colossians 1, 26 and 27. The mystery has been kept, kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's a mystery. Why is it a mystery? Because there's a liar who has taught us it's not Christ in you. It's a legal payment made in a record book where, where history is being erased. That same person who wrote the document I talked about earlier, not only is he uh, uh, argue that well, Jennings, Jennings values reason. He goes on to say the atonement is a legal process in which your sins are erased out of record books. He doesn't understand the mystery that God is revealing it's not about erasing deeds and historical facts from history. It's about erasing evil, sinfulness, fear, selfishness out of your characters, hearts, and minds and reproducing you to live and have character like Christ. So the mystery, it is bringing the universe back into unity. But how? What method does God use? God is the revealer of truth who wars against the liar and the deceiver by revealing his character, his methods, his design laws. And the truth purges the lies to win us back to trust. And in trust, we open the heart and receive the indwelling spirit who recreates us with new desires and new motives, writes a law on the heart and mind. It's no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. So the mystery of God is his plan and action to remove sin, selfishness, lies, corruption, and all deviations from his perfect design of love and restore his character of love, his methods of truth, freedom, and love into the hearts and minds of all who trust him and bring us back into a unity with him. Why is this a mystery? Because our minds are infected with the lies of the liar who obscures the truth about God. When will God's ultimate completion of this mystery, this healing and restoration of all who trust him occur? When will it happen? Notice this text, Revelation 10, verse 7. But in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound the, his trumpet, 
the mystery of God will be accomplished, just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. What, what is the mystery? We read in all those Bible verses. What is it? Christ in you, the hope of glory. Bringing all into unity under one head, Jesus Christ. This is the mystery. Do we find ourselves nearing this time? Do we see more truth is being revealed than at any time in human history? Do you remember the prophecy of Malachi? The son, S-U-N, son with a capital S, of righteousness is rising with healing in his... The, the, the many, uh, so many of the versions say wings, but it actually, the Hebrew means beams because it's the S-U-N. Healing in the beams or the rays that are emanating from the S-U-N. The S-U-N is rising with healing in his rays or his beams. And what are these rays or beams? Are they photons? Are these the rays and beams of photons? Is that what they are? It's a metaphor. Jesus is the light which lightens all men. We're in a war between the liar and the revealer. And Jesus is the revealer. And at the end of time, the son of righteousness is rising with healing. Now imagine you're in a cave, a dark cave. You've been in a cave for three days with no light. They bring you out at noon. What's that like for you? How about they bring you out before dawn and you sit there as the day dawns? See, this, at the end of time, the gross darkness covers the people. The world is in darkness about the truth about God, his designs, his character, his methods, his principles. We believe the liar's lies. But the sun, S-U-N of righteousness at the end of time is rising with healing in his beams of truth. And so at the end of time, ever increasing amount of light is going to be shining from God. We in the world of darkness are here as the day is dawning. Peter talks about the day star dawning as the day is dawning. And those who love truth will assimilate it, will partake of it, will apply it, and they can see more truth and they become more enlightened, and they grow more in the truth, and the more truth is revealed to them. But those who deny the truth, you see, those who love the truth, eventually when God comes, it says that when he comes, the wicked are destroyed by the brightness of his coming. But what about the righteous when they see the brightness? The brightness for them is, this is our God, we, have waited. we shall see him face to face, for we shall be like him. How do we become like him? The sun of righteousness is rising with healing, healing, restoration, rejuvenation, recreation, renewal, rebuilding, writing the law on the heart and mind, however you want to say it. That's as you assimilate and love the truth. Those who are lost, Thessalonians says, are lost because they did not love the truth and thus be saved or healed. So as, a, as the truth is shining at this time in history, you have the opportunity to assimilate and partake or reject. If you reject it, then the light within you becomes darkness, Jesus said. Sunday's lesson, the eminence of God. Eminence means to remain with, to indwell, to inherit. So the eminence of God would refer to God with us. God remaining close to us. God not abandoning us. God even coming to indwell us. The lesson focuses our attention on Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the multi-metal statue and his inability to remember the details, yet had the conviction that something was extremely important about that dream, but he couldn't remember the details. The story unfolds, as you know, with him calling the wise man and telling him to tell me the dream and interpretation, they claiming it's not possible, and the death sentence and Daniel pleads for time and God reveals the dream. We all know the story. What I want to focus upon are the methods of God revealed in the story. The methods of God. Revealed in the story. Remember the context of Old Testament. What's the context? Coming Messiah. Coming Messiah. Genesis 3. As soon as Adam sins, Genesis 3 sets the context. 3.15. The seed of the woman is going to crush your head, serpent. You're going to bruise his heel. The whole rest of the Old Testament is the working out of the plan for the Messiah to come. Without Jesus, human race is lost. Understand this. After Adam and Eve sin. The human race is dead in trespass and sin, has a terminal condition, is going to die eternally unless Jesus comes. Anybody disagree with that? Okay, Jesus is the means whereby humankind is saved. That's the message of Genesis 3. This is the reason you have the Bible focusing on where it focuses. God loves all people. Abraham is called the father of many nations. 
But we don't have the history of the Chinese or the Japanese in Scripture. Not because God didn't love them. He loves them. He wants them to come to salvation. But because the focus of Scripture is the great controversy in the working out of the plan of salvation. And so right in Genesis, after the flood, God calls Abraham to be the branch of the human family, his branch, his children, his, his family tree will be the branch of the human family tree through which Messiah is going to come. Satan no longer has to try and destroy all the families of, of earth. He just has to focus his energies on the Jewish family, the Abraham's descendants, and, and not just Abraham's, Isaac's, and not just Isaac's, Jacob's. And that's where we find the focus because this is where the battle is being waged for the salvation of human beings. And ultimately, if you believe the New Testament, all things in heaven and earth are reconciled to Christ at the cross. So he's, he's got a cosmic war that he's winning and, and, and then there's a battle happening to stop God's plan. Satan is working to stop it. God is working to bring. This is the context of Old Testament scripture. But Satan, of course, we know, failed. Jesus came. Praise God. And so as soon as Jesus is born on earth, Satan adjusts his strategy. He's no longer trying to stop the avenue. And in and, and one of our lessons coming up, I'll give you a whole long list of Old Testament things that are evidences of Satan working to try and oppose and stop Jesus from coming. Try to stop or shut down or destroy the avenue. But I don't have time for that today. But once Jesus is born, he, he shifts this. He no longer tries to oppose him because he's here. So he immediately tries to destroy him. Get Herod to kill baby Jesus. Now get your mind around that. If the problem of sin is legal... We simply need a sinless savior to die and shed blood to pay a legal debt. We've got sinless Jesus on earth, ready to be killed by a malevolent dictatorship to pay the price for our salvation. God didn't let that happen because that was not the problem that needed solving. Christ came to actually remedy the sin problem. And that required that he had to refute the liar. He had to be the revealer of truth. He had to be the light that lightens all men. He had to actually grow up as a human and show us what God is like. If you see me, you've seen the Father. And he had to eradicate from the human species the infection of fear and selfishness. So he is tempted in every way just like we are. Yet he overcame those temptations and developed a perfect human character. Sinless and perfect. Developed by the action of his humanity. Because divinity cannot be tempted. He was tempted in his humanity. And he overcame in his humanity. Met multiple layers we could go on. We had, but, but after Christ then comes to earth, <clears throat> succeeds in his mission, accomplishes his goal to save the species, reveal the truth, to secure the unfallen worlds and their loyalty, Satan then uh, again changes strategies. He's no longer trying to stop Messiah from coming. He's no longer trying to kill Messiah because he's already been here, died, and rose again in heaven. So he's got a new strategy. Initial first strategy, well, let's kill all those who believe in Jesus and who have accepted Jesus as their Savior. Let's kill them all. And you have the persecution in, in, the, uh, in the New Testament where uh, Saul initially was going around and Stephen is being stoned and, and persecution initially. This didn't work. So Satan re replans again and has now a new strategy. Let's attack from within. Let's infect the Christian church, the Christian people, with lies about God, lies about his law, lies about his methods, lies about what Christ came to do, and let's actually have Christians teach a pagan view of God. That's, and so basically the idea is, the new strategy is, let's stop people from coming to a knowledge of God that results in their opening their heart and trusting him that results in them receiving from Christ his victories uh, within. So let's just stop, and we say it very simply, let's stop the application of what Christ achieved in the heart of the believer. That's his new strategy. And he does that by getting us to believe a fraudulent legal model of salvation in which the applications of Christ's victory are not in your heart and mind. They're in a record book in heaven before a magistrate to plead the blood to a punitive and just, so-called, God who is the source of inflicted pain and suffering for those who don't love him. This is paganism. It's not 
it's not what Jesus reveals, it's not what the Bible teaches. And it all stems from one root lie. There's one root lie that underpins it all. And the one root lie is God's law works like human law. If you believe God's law works like human law, a system of rules, without inherent consequence, not design protocols like gravity, not, not design protocols like physics, just a system of rules. If you believe that, then you must believe God has to punish rule breakers because if you don't believe that, there's no justice. And that's what leads to this whole corruption because they've accepted God's law works like human law. Rather than believing God, which is the Advent message, the Advent message was called to call people to worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that in this, calling back to creator worship, not dictator worship. And the creator's laws are the laws upon which reality operate. And, and one of the founders of our church was brilliant on this. Read some of her quotes about his law and how they can never be changed to meet the sinner in their sin. It's like you can't change the law of respiration to meet a drowning man underwater. You can't do it. You have to take the drowning man and put them back in harmony with the law of respiration. And Christ came to take the drowning, sin-sick sinners and put us back in harmony with his law. Put the law in us, right? The law in the heart and mind. That's the plan of salvation. So, Satan's attack today, teaching this false system of religion that keeps people trapped. Yes? So just a quick clarification, though, about the, the cross still being pivotal and your, your um, uh, statement with that about it's still pivotal and the blood is so important, but it is that Christ laid aside fear and did not choose the fear pathway of self-preservation, but chose the I love you more than me, and if it comes down to you or me, I will sacrifice myself. So the cross is still huge in the plan of salvation, but our understanding of that can sometimes be skewed. So I want to clarify what you said. I don't disagree with what you said, but you've said, the way you've said it has left something vital out. Thank you. What you've said was the revelatory aspects, which some would call moral influence theory, that Christ came to reveal truth to win us to trust, to show that he is trustworthy, to show that he is loving, shows he is self-sacrificial. Oh, well, that's true. He did all that but it leaves out the remedy for our sin problem. We may trust him, but we're still sinners. How does that fix the problem? So we had to do more than simply reveal truth. And so metaphorically, um, Jesus said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part with me. Those symbols got translated into bread and wine. Bread, Jesus, the word made flesh. So bread represents the truth. So the truth aspects are represented by the bread, not by the blood. What's represented by the blood is the life the life of Christ, which is the character and the per perfect human character of Christ. And so Ellen White writes in uh, Desire of Ages, page 761, the law requires righteousness, a righteous life. This man has not to give, but Christ came in the form of man and developed a perfect character. This he offers as a free gift to all who will accept it. Hebrews chapter five, verses uh, nine and 10 says the following. Once he was made perfect, he became the source of salvation for all who will obey him. Once he was made perfect, wasn't he always perfect? No, no, no. He was always sinless. Bible perfection is not about sinlessness. Bible perfection is about maturity of character. Character cannot be created by God. Character has to be developed by the actions of the sentient being. So Adam and Eve were created sinless in Eden. Sinless but they were not yet perfected because they didn't exercise their capacities to choose to develop a perfect sinless character, which they had the ability to do prior to their fall. After their fall, no human being could do it. We're corrupted. We're weak. We don't have the power, the strength. Christ came as a human being to reveal the truth, the bread to win us to trust, but also to develop that which we needed, a new character and thus, when we come to trust, we receive the Holy Spirit who takes the victory of Christ and reproduces it in us. It's no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. We get new hearts and right spirits. Ken. I listened to a very uh, popular and, and well-known uh, commentator this week make a distinction between the Muslim tradition of, well, actually the word Islam means submit to God. Israel means struggle with God. And what you're, you've been describing all morning is the Judaic tradition of struggling with God to make it your own. So, 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 so struggle with God, uh, Israel, you know, those who with God overcome. 
That's the name Israel, with God over. So we're not struggling against God. It's important to understand because that English language could almost sound like struggling with God. We're, we're wrestling against him. No, 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 no. It's with God, united with us, we're struggling against our own carnal nature and our own fears and, 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 and uh, habit patterns. That's what we struggle against and the temptations of the devil. But we're doing it with the unified relation with God, and that's where the victory is achieved. Yeah. So there is a struggle. Uh, I want to go on here uh, to back to the methods dealing with Nebuchadnezzar now. Notice God revealed a dream to Nebuchadnezzar. But God prevents Nebuchadnezzar from remembering it. I don't believe that was accidental. I don't think it was just like our human dream. I think God prevented Nebuchadnezzar from remembering it, but remembering enough that he knew something very important was dreamt, but he couldn't remember the details. I think this was a, a mechanism, an intervention, an action, a divine revelation to Nebuchadnezzar. This wasn't just happenstance. This was an act of God. The question is why? Why did God give him the dream but then prevent him from remembering? Well, what consequence did that have? This is evidence-based thinking. What was the consequence of this intervention? God gives a dream, Nebuchadnezzar wakes up, he knows it's important, he can't remember it. A, a consequence happens now. What happens? Does Nebuchadnezzar have a strong desire to know something now? Is he invested? Is he passionate? Okay, what's the Bible say about finding God? You will find me when you search me with half, my, half your heart. <laughs> no, with all your heart. Notice, I think this was an intervention designed to motivate Nebuchadnezzar to really want to find the truth. It wasn't just a passing interest. Oh, I'm interested in that. How many of you have heard something, maybe a news story, something in science? You go, I'm kind of interested in that. It'd be, it'd be fine. I'm curious. But you're not really interested with all your heart. Yeah, we've all done that, right? No, I, think, I think this got him passionate. He wants to know something. Yes? Well, and it also revealed to him the inadequacy of his trusted advisors. So next point, yes. It showed that the, the trusted advisors were liars and frauds. Good, yes. It prevents lies presented by his false witnesses about the true revelation. So, yes, th those, are, those are the next order consequences. First order consequence, it motivated him to seek truth. Second order consequence, it prevented him from being deceived by the liars and frauds. Third order consequence, it showed that those previous uh, so-called soothsayers and wise men were actually frauds and it exposed them. And fourth order consequence, it brought Daniel to the highlight to show that there is a God in heaven and a messenger from God in heaven that he has access to so he can learn about God. So multiple layers here, but notice the, 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 the real life consequences were designed for what conclusion? to reach Nebuchadnezzar. God loves Nebuchadnezzar. God wants to save Nebuchadnezzar. You see grace at work here. This is what you see happening. And you see God's method. Did God use force to coerce Nebuchadnezzar? No. No, he used methods that would intrigue and instill Nebuchadnezzar to search for truth. And you understand, there is a difference for you searching for truth and you just, somebody just telling you, here's the truth, but you haven't actually shown any interest in knowing it yet. Have you ever had somebody tell you a truth sometime in your life, maybe a Bible teacher, Sabbath school teacher, pastor, maybe, maybe some of you, a parent, a friend, that told you a truth sometime in the past. But at that time you weren't interested and it just went right by you. And then later in life, you found yourself in a place you, and that same truth came back, and now you made it part of your life. Yeah, truth has to be embraced and applied. Monday's lesson. There's some really important things I want to get to in our lesson today. Um, we, it points out that when we face problems, we're not, we need to remember we're not alone, that we have a God who loves us and is interested in us and personally wants to help us and ultimately not help us overcome necessarily a specific crisis in, in the world, but he wants to help us ultimately to come back into unity with him. That's the ultimate goal there. But he does concern himself with the specifics of our life. And it talks about praying and how we should always remember to pray to God in our, in our lives when we have problems. I just want to point out, though, how prayer can be misused. And then how prayer is rightly used. Prayer can be misused when people pray to God for healthy lungs while they continue to smoke. You laugh at that, but I have to, I've, I've had occasional patients to do that. I have this one more commonly. People pray for healthy marriage while they cheat on their spouse. Or while they beat their spouse. Or have rages at their spouse. Conversely, I have people on the other side 
who are being physically or verbally abused praying for a healthy marriage but never set healthy boundaries, they just submit to the mistreatment. Or people pray to pass an exam but don't study. Students do that one. Weekly. Weekly. <laughs> pray for good health but refuse to eat healthy foods. I, I, do, you, do you think I'm making this up? I have just examples. There's lots and lots more like this. The point I'm making here about prayer is that we err in prayer when we pray for God to overrule the choices that he has given us to make in governance of ourselves. Notice how I said that. To overrule the choices that God has given us to make in governance of ourselves. When we, when we knowingly make choices that we have already been enlightened on by God, and we've refused to follow the light that God has given us, and then we pray for God to alter the outcome. God, I know it's dangerous to jump off the Empire State Building, but I'm going to pray that when I do, you give me wings to fly. This would be a foolish prayer, would it not? God provides us with truth, with wisdom, with opportunities, but God never does the choosing for us. He never does the choosing for us. And that's because it's your choosing to participate in the truth, which is the exercising of your individuality, which strengthens your confidence and faith and helps develop your character. Sometimes though we are faced with opportunities and situations where we don't have sufficient evidence don't have the facts, don't have the knowledge that we need, uh, a job offer comes and we don't really know much about the city, the place, the circumstances, the people working with, the coworkers, the, all the potential down road. Con and so we pray for wisdom. This is a righteous and proper prayer. Give me wisdom, give me discernment, give me evidences, help me see the points I need to, to make a, a wise decision. I want to make a decision. But sometimes even with all that, the prayer still is, okay, Lord, with all the evidences, I'm prayerfully trying to make the decision that I believe is in harmony with your will and purposes. But Lord, even so, if this is not in keeping with your plan, overrule, shut the door. God honors those prayers. I've had those prayers answered in my life. In the case of Daniel and his three friends, they needed information they could not obtain by study, by research, or from any other means in their power. There was no way they could obtain this information of the dream. There's only one place they could go, and that was to God, and they asked God, if it's your will, will you reveal this mystery to us? And God did. The lesson points out that Daniel and his friends had two types of prayer. The first type of prayer was the prayer of request. The second was the prayer of thanksgiving. After the prayer was answered, they had prayer for thanksgiving. Why are these two types of prayer important? More precisely, for whom are these types of prayer important? Does God need our prayers? Do our prayers have some impact upon us? And what are the impacts of these two types of prayers? I want you to notice they have different impacts. First type of prayer, the prayer of need, brings our hearts and minds into the truth of our own helplessness, our own limitation, our own inabilities, our own hopelessness without God. It's a prayer of humility. It's a prayer of, sub of submitting ourselves to the, to the God that we trust, the God of creation, the God who is good, that, that we are not supreme, he's supreme. It's a, it's a prayer of humility, seeking to connect our heart and mind with his heart and mind, to know his will and make his will our will to connect with our inmost being with his presence. It is a prayer of humility and connection. This is the prayer of need. This is more than a pursuit of knowledge prayer. It's not a pursuit of knowledge prayer. Such prayer seeks out the will of God in our lives and thus seeks to open us to healing and recreating God's presence. We come to the point that we may go with that prayer of need with a certain agenda in mind but as we really come into that humility of seeking God's will, I've experienced that what I was praying for became less urgent, and I became more willing to say, you know something, Lord? If that's not really best, it's okay. I'd rather have your will done. Because we're connecting to trusting in him. But we still go with the prayer of need, don't we? And, that, and, and when we do that, I think it brings us into this humble state. And then the prayer of thanksgiving 
after the prayer is answered, we're rejoicing, we're celebrating, but it, it, we, what we're doing is we're identifying with love. We're expressing our thankfulness, our adoration, our, our affiliation, and our confidence grows in God. It strengthens our faith. Thank you, God. On so many levels, it's a real experience. This is not magic. This is not mystical. This is a tangible connection with a real intelligent being. The lesson asks us to read Psalms 138. I'm not gonna read it all, but I thought I'd compare a few verses out of the NIV with the remedy Psalms. Just to let you kind of get a little subtle difference between the two. Remember the remedy's prime focus is to see scripture through design law not imperial law. Uh, verse one of 138, I will praise you, this is NIV, I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. Before the gods, I will sing your praise. The remedy. With all my heart, I give you thanks, O creator God. Before the heavenly assembly, I sing your praise. NIV, verse two, I will bow down toward your holy temple and will praise your name for the, your love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word from the remedy. I humble myself to your healing presence as taught by your holy temple. And I praise your character of love for your methods of truth and love never change. And your promise confirms that your character of love is supreme over all creation. Verse three, NIV. When I called, you answered me. You made me bold and stout hearted remedy. The day I acknowledged my need and called for your help, you answered me. You gave me confidence and strength to do what is right. Verse 7, though I walked in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the anger of my foes. With your right hand, you save me. Remedy, though I live in the midst of a world of troubles, you heal me to live eternally. You send your hand, capital H, to stand against my enemies. Though the one, capital O, at your right hand, uh, through the one at your right hand, you save me. This is referring to Jesus. God's agency. And then verse 8, NIV. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hand. Remedy. The Lord will complete his healing work in me. Your love, O oh Lord, gives life forever. Don't give up on restoring your creation. And I want to, because we're maybe getting short on time. We have time. We'll come back to Wednesday. I want to jump to, to uh, Thursday's lesson. The focus on Thursday's lesson is that the stone that destroys the image. And let's read Daniel 2, 34 and 35. This is from the NIV. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were broken in pe to pieces at the same time and became like chaff on the threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace, but the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. What does this mean? For... What, what's the frequent question I ask in here? What law lens do you use to look this through? Are you looking through the lens of a governments that work like human governments on imposed rules and use the power over method to destroy their enemies? Or are you looking through design law, God as creator, who is the source of healing and restoration for those who trust him? Are we still reading a prophecy? Yes or no? Do prophecies use symbols? Yes. Do we need to interpret the symbols? What does a hand or hands, not with that, without human hands, what do hand or hands represent in Bible symbolism? If you're not sure, what do you think of when you hear this phrase? The hand of God. What do you think of? An appendage? Power. The word. Or do you think of the power of God? The action of God? The work of God. That's what you think of when you think of the hand, okay? So in Bible symbolism, when you think of without human hands, 
Are you thinking without human power, without human methods, without human mechanisms? The context is the rise and fall of nations. That's the context of the, of the vision, is it not? The rise and fall of nations. Now we have a, a kingdom that is arising, but this kingdom will not arise with the human hand, with the power of humanity, with the ways of humanity. How do human nations rise and fall? What powers do they use? Military. Military power, destroying and killing your enemies. Is this prophecy suggesting that this kingdom is going to come, but it's not going to use the methods of the world, it's going to use a different method. When Jesus was here, did he say, my kingdom is of this world? It's not of this world. It's not of this world. Hmm. Human governments use lies, coercion, force, power over. They use selfishness. They destroy the enemy. If you don't, if you don't submit to me, I'll kill you. That's how human governments work. I'm, I'm suggesting to you, not with human hands, it's not with human power, not with human methods. It's suggesting that God establishes a kingdom, as Zechariah 4, 6 says, not by might, nor by power, but by the Spirit, says the Lord. He doesn't use the ways of humanity to establish this kingdom. This rock will be the rock of salvation. This rock is the rock through which Israel drank in the desert. Corinthians points that out. This rock is Jesus. And what power did Jesus use to establish his kingdom, which he said was not of this world? What power? Did he use, any po did he use a power? What power did he use? Truth, Truth and? Love. And love and? Freedom. Freedom. On the cross, did he have power to call 10,000? I can call 10, well, legions of angels. I've got the power. All power is given to him, John chapter 13 but he got down and washed feet. He healed. He did not use power to punish his enemies. Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. Understand, he was not like the two thieves who were powerless once they were on the cross. He had the power to come off if he wanted. But instead, with, a thought, that's right. with just a thought, he could have wiped them out with a thought. Understand, You've heard the statement, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. This is Satan's method of governance. Satan wants to exalt his throne above all others to rule over. But God, Christ, who thought equality with God was not something to be grasped, humbled himself to serve. He humbled himself into service. This is a different power. It's a power not with human hands. There, thus, but the kingdom that is coming will destroy the kingdoms of the world. So it's going to destroy them, but, but it doesn't use the methods of the world to do the destroying. How do we understand that? Well, Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, we really live in the world, we don't wage war as the world does. The weapons we use are not worldly. They have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish every argument and pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and take captive every thought. This is a kingdom of truth and love that demolishes lies. Remember we started out, Satan is the liar, God is the revealer. The son of righteousness is rising to reveal truth that demolishes the lies that keep us in darkness. Daniel goes on to interpret the meaning of the rock set up without human hands in verse 44. In, those, in, in, in the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end. But it, but it will itself endure forever. When you heard these words from scripture that it will crush all those other kingdoms, hopefully another Bible texts are popping up in your mind that, 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 that use the same language. The seed of the woman is going to crush your head, Satan. How did Jesus crush Satan's head? Hebrews 2.14. He took upon himself human flesh that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death that is the devil wait a second Ellen White says that God could have destroyed Satan and his sympathizers as easily as one cast a pebble to the earth but he would not do it to use force would give a, 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 a pretext or a reason or justification for compelling and compelling powers found only under Satan's governments the methods of the world 
This is a kingdom that doesn't practice the methods of the world. What power did Jesus use? The power of truth and love presented in an atmosphere of freedom. And thus Paul writes in Romans 16.20 about each of you. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. How does God crush Satan under our feet? By restoring his character and methods of love in each of us. God's kingdom is the kingdom of truth, love, and freedom. It is built upon the design laws of God, the supreme law of God being love. Love can never be coerced. It can never be forced. Thus, the kingdoms of the world are crushed. Lies, crushed by truth. Selfishness and fear, crushed by love and trust. And coercion, crushed by freedom. Gracious Father in heaven, we love you. We thank you that after Adam and Eve broke trust with you, changed themselves, became filled with fear and selfishness, that you did not abandon us, but you implemented your plan to send Jesus to achieve that which we could never achieve, not just to reveal truth, Lord, but to gain the victory that we could never gain, to live a perfect, sinless life, and to eradicate the infection of fear and selfishness being tempted in every way, just like we are, but, but without sin. And now, we thank you that Jesus reigns supreme in heaven and is guiding all the agencies uh, in the heavenly arsenal for our redemption. And we ask that your spirit of truth will be poured out, enlightening, transforming, and taking the victories of Christ, reproducing it in us and empowering us to be your agencies on earth to lighten this world that you can come soon. We pray in your holy name. Amen.